um, the second session of the day um, that will focus on social, political, and economic strategies to empower the poor. And let me invite um, Professor Wang Yi from the Chinese Academy of Sciences to coordinate this session. Thank you, Marcos. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I welcome you back. Uh, my name is Wang Yi from uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences Institutes of Science and Development. It's a, a science-based policy research think tank uh, in China. Uh, so t today, uh, I think after two and a half days uh, discussion, this um, important meeting moved to a very comprehensive session uh, the, entitled the, the Social, Political, and Economic uh, Strategy to Empower the Power. So I think uh, very important. So in this session, we have uh, three speakers, uh, uh, very important speakers. The first one is uh, um, Dr. Dr. Sarah Cook, uh, he's uh, from uh, uh, he's, you know, uh, he's a professor of University of uh, New South uh, Wales. The second one is uh, Raina Gosh, and uh, unfortunately uh, she, uh, due to some reason, uh, visa and uh, emergency, she is not available to attend the meeting. But uh, 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 Madam uh, Madam Rain, uh, Madam. Uh, uh, Elisa, 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 rise, well, well, please uh, deliver uh, her the uh, point and uh, share uh, Professor Raina's uh, points uh, with us. The third speaker is very famous uh, investor in uh, sustainability areas, the, uh, Mr. Marcelo uh, Cavanaho, Cavanaho uh, Andrit. So sorry, <laughs> my presentation. So I think uh, we have a uh, three uh, keynote speaker here, and uh, we would like to uh, like to give a speech uh, uh, one by one, and then the panel discussion. Now, first speaker is uh, 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 Sarah Cook. Uh, he's he's a rich uh, experience in many countries, in many organizations, including the China and uh, and also the UK and uh, for for many. UN related uh, institutions and uh, now it's the uh, University of uh, New New South Wales uh, University. So you, now, uh, Professor uh, Cook, you have the floor. So welcome. Uh, thank you, um, and it's always really tough to speak straight after lunch, and particularly given the really exciting sessions we had this morning. Um, so I was asked to talk about empowerment and strategies for empowering the poor. Um, and, you know, this is a very big topic, and I'm not sure that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to sort of talk to very directly. So what I'm going to do is talk about social protection programs and the evidence we have on how they are, they can have an empowerment impact. Um, and try and also show how, through the evidence that we've generated on these programs, um, we're actually also moving from evidence to action, which is one of the issues that we've been discussing here. Um, I note that um, until very recently, I was the director of the Office of Research for UNICEF. And the reason I put that there is because a lot of the evidence I'm drawing on and the research was done um, with colleagues at the office. Um, just very briefly, why even focus on social protection in this context? And I think we all, I just wanted to refer to something that Professor Sarah Geldin said on the, in his first um, keynote, that social policy is not just about protecting people against economic policies or picking up the pieces for economic policy. It has its own rationale and its own objectives. And I was previously the director of the UN Research Institute for Social Deve Development, where we talked about social policy as having the functions of protection, distribution, reproduction, social reproduction, so the care economy, and transformation. And in talking about empowerment, we're really talking about how these social policies and social protection initiatives can change structures or challenge structures of power and become transformative. Um, I'll talk about the evidence base 
large, well, based on work, a large program of work in su across sub-Saharan Africa, um, and then talk about the evidence to action. I do want to say, however, at the beginning, and we'll come back to this, that none of this is a magic bullet. Creating empowerment, creating the results we want, is always going to be complex, and there's no one intervention that's going to solve the problems. Um, just highlighting a couple of things that have been already said as a basis for what I'm talking about. We've already heard that income alone, increasing incomes, is not going to necessarily reduce poverty. And equally, income increases or poverty reduction are not necessarily going to lead to empowerment. In all of these processes, inequality, power relations are key, both income inequalities and horizontal or group inequalities. And it's often at the intersections of these inequalities, as we've also heard. So when you've got gender, race, ethnicity, alongside poverty, etc., where you get the most intractable problems of exclusion, of disempowerment. And so trying to reach those groups to provide agency to, d to empower is a particularly pr uh, difficult and challenging um, goal. And I think, you know, having some definition of empowerment, and there aren't clear measures or definitions of empowerment, but we need to be thinking about the capabilities that people have, so their skills, their education, their opportunities, their ability to exercise these, to make choices, um, their ability to have voice and participate, and ultimately their ability to challenge structures, the structures of power that are disempowering. Um, I think we know a lot about social protection in this part of the world in particular, but when we started this research, there wasn't so much done in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, he, in Latin America, you, most of the programs, many of the programs are conditional cash transfers. In sub-Saharan Africa, they're more likely to be unconditional or with soft conditionalities um, and a significant number of child benefits or child grants. Um, sorry. The, just in a very rough classification, the social protection obviously has this function of just income support and, and safety nets, if you like, um, but they can also be used through conditionalities or other mechanisms to incentivize behavioral change. And at the top, they can also, I think, well, the evidence we're showing, have a critical role in changing individual behaviors and improving well-being, but also in then leading to empowerment. Um, this is about the project, the transfer project, which is a 10-year initiative. It started in 2009 and includes universities, UNICEF, FAO, um, and then partners in the countries where the programs are, both national governments and all of the um, programs that we're looking at are national um, social protection programs. They're not sort of pilots or NGO-run programs. The, these are all national ones, so they have the capacity to scale up. In order to ensure that the evidence that was being generated feed back into action into the design of programs, into the scaling up of programs, into government policy. And that's all recorded, de, um, documented in, in this book. Um, so also as background, the rise of social protection in Africa, you can see a huge tripling in the number of programs over the period from about 2000. But still, if we look at um, the percentage of population covered in sub-Saharan Africa, um, it, it's very low compared to the rest of the world. So there's still very limited social protection coverage. Um, but I think there's also a lot of evidence that the scaling up is affordable given um, current fiscal conditions and growth. Um, so at the moment, there's uh, research, these evaluations in, about in 10 countries. Some of them have been going on since 2010, and there's multiple waves. So we've got a lot of data that we can um, examine to look at uh, the questions, a range of questions. Um, as I said, in Africa, the programs tend to be unconditional, um, targeted on poverty, 
often with manual um, payment, so we ca some are moving to digital forms of payment. But one of the things about the, the manual forms, although they also have their problems, is that there are opportunities to engage and deliver complementary services. And for the empowerment outcomes that I'll talk about, this ability to interact with beneficiaries and potentially deliver accompanying services, what we often call now cash plus is actually a, an important feature. Um, they're also in the studies with places we're looking at um, primarily going to women beneficiaries or to female headed households. Um, so what, what does some of the evidence um, say? I'll go through some of the more general evidence poverty um, we see has decreased, so headcount measures, poverty gap measures, the, the measures vary across different surveys, but there we see positive results. Similarly, on food security, we see positive results. Um, and then I think an important point is that we see, um, we have no evidence, and we've looked for it, of, of the spending on undesirable goods, tobacco, alcohol, etc. And this, I think, is a very important um, outcome of this program, is that we've really been able, by having this huge amount of data over a number of countries, really uh, over time, um, to challenge many of the misperceptions about cash transfers. So there's, there's a very common response that you can't give money to poor people. They'll spend it on the wrong things. Um, or that it will incentivize fertility increases. We absolutely find no evidence. And I think it's been very important that we've been able to really put that together. And it's a, a very widely cited now um, result from this research that, that the myths have sort of been challenged, that you've got strong evidence to overcome those biases that often decision makers, policy makers, or other people might have. Um, school enrollment has improved, um, similar to the results found in Latin America. Um, increases in material well-being of children, the kind of indicators we were talking about on the first day. I didn't say that all of these impact evaluations and the studies include both qualitative and quantitative um, data collection. Those, the quali quantitative studies are experimental or quasi-experimental randomized control trials and, and other methods. Um, the quanti qualitative interviews that accompanying them are really important for understanding some of these issues, particularly around empowerment. Um, and so we get women's own definitions of what they think empowerment means, um, which then also enables us to better interpret the data and to think about um, its implications. Um, in addition to then the actual data collection there, we've been trying to put that in a broader context by understanding some of the measures, mechanisms that might lead to empowerment. And one of these is violence. So if, if women are at risk of violence or experiencing violence, the chance of them really being empowered is, and ha being able to exercise agency is very low. And cash transfers can have different kinds of effects and they may, may decrease violence but it may also increase violence. Um, so we've done a review of all the possible literature on this, um, including from Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere. And we have you know, a conceptual framework which looks at the um, cash transfer program design, the different outcomes, the outcomes of increasing income but also of increasing knowledge, skills, access to services, which accompany the, the programs, as well as the social networks. And then we've identified different pathways through which these could lead to the empowerment outcomes we want, including economic security and emotional well-being, um, intra-household conflict, and then women's empowerment. And these can have different outcomes, so these are empirical questions, do they, if women have the cash, is that going to ease intra-household conflict and reduce risks of violence, or could it actually increase um, conflict? What we see from the review of the literature on the whole, largely um, 
there's a decrease. So you can see on this side quite a significant decrease, particularly in physical and sexual violence, less so in emotional violence. Um, and looking through those three pathways that I outlined, we see on the emotional security and well-being, this is overwhelmingly positive. So we see positive linear links between um, those variables. On intra-household conflict, you also see on the whole positive. So uh, there's a, the cash, the social protection program leads to reduction in violence through this channel, reduce conflict within the household. That's a bit more varied, but it's still a strong link. On women's empowerment, um, we have much more mixed findings. And that's partly because there is a very large body of literature on women's empowerment. But again, the definitions, the criteria for defining what that means um, is, is there's a lot of variation, let's say. So we have much less conclusive findings on whether, this, whether women are empowered through these cash transfers and programs um, and the violence, whether it dec cl declines. Um, so I think there's, there is some strong evidence from here that these programs do lead to declines in violence, that there's a shift in the structural um, conditions that lead um, to violence through these, but there's still quite a lot of research that's needed, including on the way that programs are designed to have these outcomes. So it's not automatic that programs lead to these outcomes. And we really have to understand more about, you know, who has um, the resources, how you design them so that women do retain control of resources, whether the women being the main be beneficiary is a key feature, um, and there's not so much research um, on that. Um, we were also obviously at UNICEF interested in violence against children, and here the, the channels are much more complex, and actually the, the um, results are, are less clear, um, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, but I do just want, in the childhood sort of um, life course, if you like, to mention adolescence and focus a little bit on that. And we've heard a lot about adolescence today in, in, and over this, these three days as a quite a critical period of life that we know that there is now becoming a lot more science around this period, the adolescent brain, the, you know, the sort of behavioral issues, attitudes to risk which we need to take into consideration in designing programs. We have a lot more information on early childhood division, d development, on nutrition in early years and, and um, in utero. We're beginning now to focus much more on this adolescent period. And we've heard so much over these three days about why youth adolescence is a critical age, and particularly given the demographics in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, if we're going to achieve the uh, SDGs, they're critical. If we're going to really break into generational cycles of poverty, this is the place to start. If you want to give the children that are about to be born the best chance in life, we have to intervene now. And if we're going to reduce fertility, th this is the group that you need to an uh, intervene with. So there's a lot more research and really focus going on on this group and trying to understand what kind of programs can actually generate empowerment um, for adolescents as they translate transition into adulthood into the labor market into families um, and so there's a range of pro ki kinds of programs obviously it's the second one the cash transfers that we've been looking at through this program but what we're also looking at is how to link the cash transfers to other programs that might also have empowerment outcomes um, and so the overview of the evidence, again, we see very strong positive links between households receiving the cash transfers and food security, material well-being, and increased school enrollment at secondary level. So those are all positive results. Where it's more mixed are these things that really might be the, the more empowerment-related um, factors, including you know, whether they're um, having to work in hazardous conditions, 
mental health we've heard about, trying to understand the impacts of stress, of poverty, um, the mental health at this age group. Violence is another key element. Um, and then I think, how, how can, what's the evidence about, where well, there is some evidence that cash transfers can delay sexual debut, um, so reducing likelihood of teenage pregnancies, um, and also obviously risks of HIV, and, and in delaying um, marriage. So we do see some evidence, in some very positive evidence, but it's much more mixed, that these cash transfer interventions can have these much broader impacts in adolescents. There's very little on health service utilization, and I think that would be another interesting um, area to explore more. And I think where some of the limits of these cash transfers in trying to get to these more empowerment outcomes are, you know, one is that, you know, poverty, exclusion, disempowerment is driven by so many different factors, and no one instrument can address all of them. Um, and in particular, cash alone won't address the underlying structural drivers of exclusion and um, disempowerment. There's also the behavioral issues, and in adolescence, those are particularly, you know, the risk-taking behaviors, sort of issues that we're beginning to understand more about, as well as access to information. Um, and then these broader moderators and broader structural context, including things like access to services. Are there actually services there that people can get access to? What's the quality um, of those services? And so I think in addressing these vulnerabilities and in moving towards you know, empowering this adolescent group and supporting safer, better transitions to um, adulthood. We need to look not just at the, at the demand side, the, the cash, which in, uh, um, is the demand, en enables people to demand services, um, but also the supply side. And I think that's where we're trying now to look at different kinds of cash plus interventions where we add in, um, whether it's service delivery, whether it's access to services, better quality services, whether it's information, whether it's skills training, things that can um, work with the cash to um, get better outcomes for, for this age group. Um, so I think there's promising transitions that this can help, but as we've said, you know, cash transfers, any program is never a silver bullet there are always many other um, interventions that need to go alongside if we're really going to address the structural drivers that lead to inequality and exclusion. And I think it's also worth saying that these are also need to be long-term, which is why, as you see, the research has been going on for 10 years in different places and uh, asking increasingly deeper and more sophisticated questions but it's going to be a long-term process to overcome the underinvestment and the structural constraints um, that impe you know, impede um, these better outcomes. Um, and finally, um, you know, there's the issue of how does this evidence that we're generating really immediately try feed in and influence policy and action on the ground. And part of that is the question of how we do the research and who we're doing it with. So this, as I said at the beginning, is all with local actors. It's all with national governments. It's engaging with national government programs. And there's always dialogue across countries. So countries are learning from each other and they're adapting and adopting um, the models um, as, as they learn. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sarah, to give us a, a very important uh, uh, evidence-based evidence research based on, on uh, UNICEF experience. And she showed us about, uh, uh, and also to explain uh, what's uh, the multi role of a social policy and the social pr uh, protection. And, uh, and also about uh, the long-term uh, investment. I think um, later, later on, uh, the Professor Marcelo will uh, explain the value, uh, shared value uh, platform and, uh, with, with us and com combine with uh, the long-term investment. Thank you, thank you again for the time. Next speaker would be the uh, 
Professor Raina Ghosh, uh, uh, he's a professor in uh, Mackey University and, uh, and also the Dean of the ed ed Educations. He also the member of the uh, TWAS, uh, the, the uh, Developing World Academy and also the, the member fellow of the uh, Canadian uh, uh, Academy, uh, National Academy. Because uh, she's not available, we would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Elisa uh, uh, Rice to, to deliver Professor Reina's uh, speech. Thank You're welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm sorry I cannot be Ratna Gosh. I'll do my best to impersonate her. <laughs> but I mean, when we got, when I got her email yesterday, they asked me to present, knowing that I'm not um, intimate with her uh, area of specialization. I thought of the limitations of technology that we discussed yesterday. She could send me the email in fractions of seconds, minutes, but she cannot convey the depth of her presentation because what I can do is just read. I'm not, I will not even be able to answer questions. I mean, if you have doubts, you have criticism, I cannot answer. <laughs> but anyway, uh, she starts with the idea that we, go, we gave her that to look at education as empowerment. Uh, she also told me that I could skip and go very fast, so I'm not betraying her. Uh, she starts from the idea of Paulo Freire, who is sort of a forefather of the, of the notion of empowerment. A Brazilian educator, he basically thought of education as a process to raise awareness of causes of inequality. Uh, his book, was translated into English in 1970. I, I didn't know about it, but she says it became very influential around the world. But uh, after talking about the impact of this educator that used education essentially as an instrument for social mobilization about inequality, uh, she went very quickly to discuss global goals for education for all. So she starts commenting on 1990, when the, there was this idea of an international effort to educate every citizen everywhere. Then she moves to 2000 with the Millennium Development Goals, with the goals were slightly more specified. And finally, the idea of the SDGs with more specific, I don't go through the specific targets because we have already mentioned it in the days before. So what has been achieved and what has been learned? Of course, an even achievement goals, education goals were not met in many of the countries of the South. Gender equality is still a distant goal in most countries, even the North, she says, but we learned some lessons that we fail to target the root causes of poverty, inequality in society, especially in gender inequality, structural and societal, the multifaceted and interdependent holistic nature of development, there's not enough focus on human rights, on sustainable economic capabilities, that the goal should be for all countries, not only for the South, because of course there is also poverty in the North. Countries of the North have many inequalities within their society. Poverty, gender inequality, unequal access to many resources are widespread phenomena. Enough goals need institutions to implement and monitor them. So she reminds us that quantity is not quality. Education for all had an emphasis on increasing numbers. That indicates a robust relationship between schooling and earnings, revolution of rising expectations, 
safety matters. If there are jobs, the education received will not qualify for many jobs. Unemployment will cause unrest because people think they deserve jobs. Education to a large extent globally, especially in countries of the South, is what Freire called a banking mode, model. Wrote learning, not critical in inquiry basic. Basically, what the idea of empowerment from Freire meant was that we should uh, uh, abandon that idea that education is essentially the formation of human capital and look also to social capital. Uh, she calls attention to the passivity of students in the traditional way of conceiving education. Students are not actively involved because they avoid relating the learning to their own experience. So it was sort of a alienated knowledge that they were receiving. Because they are not constructing the knowledge and you forget what they hear. So what aspects of poverty impact education most? I think the the most interesting conclusion here that she ends up is that the education and poverty are, ki are kind of a vicious circle. Poverty affects education and education, um, I mean, students cannot learn because they are poor and because they are poor they, they end up not learning. So that's why Paulo Freire thought the idea of interfering, putting something to change the way people perceive their own reality. In other words, I think uh, empowerment for him and what people took from him was that it's, it's necessary to, to convert the students into human agents, to take themselves the responsibility. So this is the cyclical relation that she pre uh, observes. Po poverty prevents people from obtaining good education and lack of, edu of good education creates poverty. So I think she said I could skip this. Uh, she, I mean, it's important to call attention to gender issues that she mentioned. Education, the, the evidence that education benefits girls at higher rates than boys, delays marriage and have children, have less children, increases ability to earn wages, decreases family violence, increases decision-make power for women. Women focus on children. Uh, barriers to achieving universal education goals. So she mentions what we already mentioned briefly yesterday. She, universal primary education uh, involves problems getting child labor, bad schools, high dropout rates, teacher absenteeism, bad infrastructure. So things that uh, getting children to school would actually affect uh, be effective to control those problems. Enrollment in grade one does not ensure remaining in high school, in school wastage with dropouts. Output levels often so low that students cannot enroll in secondary schools. So she goes back to the idea of gender equality, that girls have less education because of gender discrimination, boy preference, girls married off and disposed as burdens, um, girls kept at home, lack of physical facilities such as toilets and residences in rural areas. Inequality and discrimination. Inequality in society and educator, uh, education, data shows that inequality in education driven by quality rather than access. The least unequal societies have the lowest poverty levels. What causes inequality? low levels of education and skills led to unemployment, poor health, large families, and can be intergenerational. Unequal opportunities can lead to poverty, and poverty can lead to social exclusion. Education discrimination, the, the question of unequal treatment, discrimination due to difference in gender, ethnicity, race, culture, religion, sexual preference, disability, in class. At societal, institutional, individual levels, there are attitudes of teachers, administrators, etc. She then focuses on best practice, which she thinks is a good way out of the deadlocks. She mentions Brack now working in eight countries, 
that has had high impact on poverty reduction. Integrated development programs with special focus on girls and special needs students. Uh, Brock is considered to be the world's biggest secular private education system, going from early childhood to tertiary level, focusing on inclusive education, partner with governments and target the poorest children to complete basic primary education in eight countries. Provide teacher training, libraries, computer, aided learning at the secondary level, provide scholarships with at least in Bangladesh and Uganda, use both schools in hard to teach areas in Bangladesh to reach the poorest of the poor. So the best practice could be summarized in this example that she selected. The impact of good practices. In this case, multi-pronged education programs from preschools to primary, secondary, and university levels, mobile libraries, education for special need children, multi-purpose non-formal and multi-purpose community centers, mobile, mobile education, computer-aided learning, adolescent clubs, sport trainings, English language, and ICT classes. In, uh, she mentions also another example, the scope in Bangladesh for females. You can see the evidence, the examples, you can read faster than I read. Actually quite noteworthy results. So now she's approaching the end and she's calling attention for the, in, the need for integrated approach. Education is essential to eliminating poverty, but it's necessary to target the the vulnerable groups, the very poor women and marginalized people. Education should be multidimensional, skill training in basic literacy, numeracy, and IT, develop itself concepts, science and technology, as well as social sciences, knowledge in human rights, arts, music, sports, Greatest impediment to education is social prejudice, she concludes. Improved teacher education and teacher attitudes is crucial. Social prejudice regarding gender, special needs children. So the, these things set the stage for priorities and effective policies. So increase public funding of education as a percent of GDP rather than as a share of the budget. Public allocation of funds to education is an investment, not an expenditure. Lack of education leads to inequality, which in turn leads to lack of development. Public-private partnership can build on innovative institutions. She goes back to the focus on women's education, to the extent that it promotes the equity that mother's education highly is highly correlated to higher levels of education. It's important for future generations. And it's most urgent to have good teacher education. Priority should be given to attracting good students to teach and give them high pay, like the example of Finland. Educational institutions, teaching methods need to be inclusive. Discrimination based on class, caste, gender, sexual orientation, religion, and ethnicity are very damaging for education and for society at large. She asked me in a, in a message to be specifically emphatic about this last thing, the role of, of academies. She thinks it's fundamental that academies contribute to raising the equality of teacher education institutions focus on evidence-based teaching, inquiry, dialogical method. Raise the status of women in STEM fields is also critical. With that, she finishes, and I thank you as well for the patience to listen to my reading. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor 
Alisa. Uh, I think it's a very good uh, explanation and uh, to give a very uh, comprehensive uh, re reading about uh, uh, Professor Raina's uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, his uh, presentation, not only, the, uh, I think uh, the basic idea is education for all and also link with uh, many the social factors uh, of the, uh, including the equality, inequality, the agenda, uh, and, uh, and so on. So also the mentioned about the uh, quality and the quantity of the education and um, uh, best practice. Uh, and uh, mo most important is the integrated approach for the education. And the, the finally, the suggestion to the academy. And uh, thank you. Thank you for, for Professor Aina. And also, thank you for, for, for Professor uh, 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 Elena. Sorry. Elena. 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 Professor. He's also the Vice President of uh, International Science Council. I think a very important. Uh, 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 person in, in, in this field. So in this session, last speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Marcelo, Marcelo, Marcelo uh, Caravajo, uh, Andre. Uh, I think that they will give a very, very uh, early in, in impressive uh, CV. This co-founder co in many of the uh, company, uh, co uh, cap cap capital investment, including the Earth Capital, partner and also the Pro uh, Nature International, the Tyre Capital Fund, and also uh, ASICO, ASICO, the bank, it's many, many, and I think. So I, I think he will uh, show us and uh, share with us about the value shared uh, uh, platform and how to, to go beyond the green, green finance. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Marcelo, you have a floor. I think you are very, uh, I think you, you, you must be very uh, active and uh, very good uh, speakers, uh, but uh, please uh, keep time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind words. Just being busy, that's all. Well, uh, well I've, I'll put my timer here so I don't get carried away. Um, I prefer to speak because there's a PowerPoint, but it's uh, it's a it's a very simple con concept, but it's there is a complexity to it that I I think it's better to appeal to your common sense, and you're all very smart people, and so here it goes. I, I created an institution. One of the things I created 36 years ago was a development agency. It was a so it was a nonprofit that was developed was dedicated to create economies, sustainable, diversified economies in poor areas. The term sustainable didn't exist at the time, but we had the social, economics, and environment mix to explain for that. But that was the concept. It's to build economies and bring quality of life to the ones that didn't have one. And we ended up experimenting many ways and chose to work with extractive industry and infrastructure industry, because those very large investments, those are, um, those are um, capital intensive uh, industries, they're not labor intensive, they create an illusion of development and wealth where, wherever they, they are present, and it never realizes. So social unrest, environmental degradation follows, follows the deception and the, the frustration for not achieving a better call their life with their presence. Th when those industries come to a region which is poor and unprepared, it accelerates the, proce the process of degradation. But if you use the financial muscle that that industry brings to the region uh, and manage it properly, you can achieve exactly the opposite. You can use, you can achieve exactly an induction of an economic model that is sustainable, diversified and um, inclusive, hence a good way to, to fight poverty. And obviously you have to, for, for, to achieve that, you have to inject financial mechanisms, science, technology, and uh, good management, like you do in any other. So we've designed a methodology to do that in the vicinity of those industries because not only they have the capital to kick off the process, but also 
their very presence will accelerate the rate of degradation of such region. From 300 years time to degrade it, we'll do it in three. Flipping the coin, their presence guarantee, if you manage it properly, that, that financial impact, you can um, f reverse the speed and have a big success much faster, much sooner than an area where you don't have an economic, a predominant economic driver. Meaning you're gonna end up having a much faster success and a wise man once told me nothing succeeds more than success. So that's just human. So we gang up with the big bad boys, oil, the gas, the mining, the hydro, the financial institutions, IFC, the big banks, and we and went on to implement the, the, the methodology adjusted, we made many mistakes, we corrected them, then made new ones, and that, that's how it goes. You guys know about experiments much better than I do. So we ended up with something which was quite solid, and with the IFC, IFC is the is a private arm of the World Bank. The IFC is probably one of the biggest financiers of those industries. And they have the World Bank behind them as a controlling shareholder that mandates sustainability and more, and more attention to this on their investments. So they needed to create mechanisms to um, have to, to abide by the rules that their shareholder uh, um, would impose to them. So they, I won an award in 1997. Uh, was uh, we were chosen by the American Academy of Science as the best implementation methodology for this that we do, and the World Bank got that analysis that the Academy did and ended up picking us up and chose our methodology to joint venture and create the shared value platform. Shared value platform is a platform that is operational and financial. We very briefly, we go into a region where there is a predominant economic driver. It could be oil, gas, could be rail, could be port, could be any large and hydro, any large investment, capital intensive, not labor intensive. Ideally in an area that is not prepared for it, the middle of nowhere, usually with population that are not very wealthy or not prepared. So we map out stakeholders, there's a methodology to gather them and to design uh, the first strokes of a governance structure. And with that first exercise, we end up identifying 10, 12, 15 value chains that are, are appropriate for the region, that are vocational. And some of them, that they, it's very bottom up, the exercise. They have to be completely including, included in owning all this. But the opposite, the other side is sometimes they don't see things and they, we have more information than they do. So we also feed that information, make them aware of what's possible they don't know, and everybody ends up with informed decisions on, let's say, 10, 12 value chains. Then the, bank, the bankers come in and they start doing feasibility studies. Feasibility studies are carried out, let's say, five very feasible value chains are detected. From that, you do proper business plans that you can take to any bank, any CFO or any bank. And uh, not that you're gonna do that because they're probably not gonna finance it because it's exotic or it's different. But anyway, it needs to have that kind of quality and precision in terms of numbers technology to be used, markets, strategies, all that. With that, let's say five, with a pipeline of five investable businesses, and by this, the, the choice of those value chains need to be um, one of the characteristics, one of the, one of the main important elements is that they need to be scalable. That, those five business plans, they need to have the capacity to create an economic anchor to a given region. This economic anchor should provide, in mid-long term, 10, 15 years, a financial independence of that region vis-a-vis -vis the big uh, infrastructure investment that's happening. The infrastructure investment is gonna pay for the preparation phase that I'm describing right now, but it should no longer be required to pay any bills. 
those business plans should be attractive enough money to attract capital from the outside. How, that, how does that happen? Once you have the business plans, let's say five, a pipeline of five business plans, you then know exactly how much money you're gonna need, and usually the time frame of the first cycle of that investment should be a little longer than normal, 12, 15 years. Private equity is usually 8, 10, so that's a little, little further, a uh, little longer. But once you have that business, the, the, that pipeline, you know exactly how much money you're gonna need. So you go out there and raise the money, create a blended finance structure. The blended finance structure is composed of two parts, 20, 15% of non-profit impact capital and 85, 80% of impact for-profit capital. The first part, the non-profit capital is invested on the risk chapter of the five business plans. Usually the, the most important, the most prevalent, or uh, the biggest amount of investment necessary on the risk in the portfolio of the companies is usually capacity building. Education, training, formal or, or technical, doesn't matter. It's usually linked to that. You may have, you may found health issues, for example. We had an experience in Mozambique, we needed to D, uh, to take away malaria before we could teach anybody anything because they were too, too, it was too much. So anyway, you, you, you get what I mean, what I'm saying. You de-risk the portfolio by investing in the non-profit impact capital first, and then the for-profit capital following the process. It's an independent manager, but it follows the process very closely. Once they see that de-risking happening, they will then deploy the capital they will feel comfortable with the risk profile of that portfolio to deploy their capital. The capital goes in, and there's the investments and the companies grow. What's the legal structure around this thing? I'm being very pragmatic. You need all this to make this thing happen. The legal structure you, you create on the preparation phase is a, depending on the legal structure of each country and cultural, but normally it's something similar to a holding company. That holding company owns the pipeline and negotiates the investments with the fund. Their holding company is managed by MBAs, by, by bankers, by people that, by, by company, co corporate managers, uh, like a family office. But the owners of that holding company, the shareholders, are all of the members of the community, everybody. Government doesn't sit there, but the individuals that sit on the government chair if they, they have shares, meaning you have the aligned interests of all of the community um, people, all of the community members, their interests will be as well aligned with the large infrastructure investment alongside as possible. So once you finish this first process and you, you raise the capital, the, the, the um, the blended capital structure to make the investments and investments begin, you then pay back the money that you spent so far doing what I just described. What I just, so there are two financial moments in this. The preparation phase that lasts between 12 and 36 months, costs around two to, and that is, you know, due to difficulties in the region, logistics, whatever. There is differences in places. Once you raise, the 150, 200 million dollars here to invest on this pipeline for the next 10, 15 years, you then pay back the money that you invested on the prep phase in a, as a form of a revolving fund. This revolving fund then begins a new cycle, exactly like the one I described, and will generate a new pipeline and new investments in one to three years' time. And meanwhile, the other ones go on following their own investment life that was designed on the business plans. So there's really no rocket, rocket science in this. This is pretty much common sense. This is our all market mapping really new. Even the blended finance, George Soros used to do this 20 years ago, so it's nothing really super new. But it's the, it's the, it's the approach of doing it all together, the way you combine those elements, that is having a lot of success. success. Just last week, the Prime Minister of Peru and, and some of the ministers 
have announced to the public that the Share Value Platform became a national strategy for the country of Peru to unlock $65 billion in mining investments into the country. So that was a very interesting uh, development of that. And um, we are now moving on this concept into Brazil, Mozambique, Nepal, in addition to Peru, obviously, and beginning to get other calls. We have to be careful not to expand ourselves too thin, but it's, there's a level of complexity to this, but it's doable because you have people that understand each one of the elements of that. The management part of this, this structure is a little more tricky, but people can do that. It's doable, we're doing it. So this is the shared value platform. In my opinion, this is something that has worked very well. We have 36 years of experience doing bits and pieces of this, and some of some in some different countries we did all of it in a smaller scale. For example, we did it in Niger Delta, we did this in, a, in the Peruvian Amazon for the Camisea Natural Gas Project, we did it in, in, in different places in the world. And now, for the last 16 years, we've been developing this methodology to scale, and for the last five years, we've been implementing it. So it's working very nice, it's early days, but it's, um, I mean, I was invited to, to talk about how to manage and how do we contribute to eradicating poverty and using science, using financial mechanisms, using whatever tools that we have in place. And this is just sharing the experience that we have had over the last 30 something years. So Pernatura is, is a Brazilian, it was founded in Brazil, but has been present historically in 61 countries, 36 years of age. But one of the things that in the early days of it is I didn't, I didn't have any environmentalist friends. I had some scientist friends, by chance, and I had businessmen. And uh, the combination of those two, they made me, or caused my first big challenge when I started Pernatura, which was a 50-year plan. They asked me to design and structure a 50-year strategic plan. I had no clue what that was. I really, when I was 23, I had no idea what that meant. They helped me design it, and it was the best thing we have ever had. Planning, structuring, strategy, and it worked beautifully. It was the first contact with the business tools I've, I've ever had in my life, and it was very successful. Just, just an aside, I'm a medical doctor by training, so I, this is not really my forte. I have to learn by doing it. So, but it works. It really works. And in our experience, the complexity of things we lead, we deal with in our institution is such that we understood from the early days that no one has the know-how to do this in-house. Not even the biggest universities, the biggest in scientific institutions, government agencies. So from the early days, one of the key cornerstone strategies that we have adopted was we understanding that we will never have the know-how in-house we adopted the know-who strategy. Instead of the know-how, we had the know-who. And we then developed a relationship with over 400 institutions, and, then, and most of them are science-based. Just an example, we started a project with Shell in Peru, then the Camisea Natural Gas Project, in early 90s. And uh, it was in an area that, according to the diversity level in the world, then, Peruvian institutions didn't have that much of expertise in terms of biodiversity research and all that. So in, in, con in combination with the University of Pacific of Peru, we've agreed that we should invite the Smithsonian Institution to come in, transfer know-how and, and, and science to the Pacifica and other local institutions in Peru, and would then create a, the, the baseline of our, the basis of our project, scientific base to deal in such a s delicate region. And we did that. And to this date, since the early 90s, the Smithsonian and Pacifica and other institutions in Peru are just booming. So I think this is so fertile and so interesting that uh, it has many other implications that just the creation of a quality of life for the, the poor, which obviously is the main objective, but there have other ripple effects. So I think that's, that's it. I'm leaving two minutes spare to my Next speaker to my chairman. So, yeah, I'll try to turn to the next speaker. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Marcelo, for the explanation of the, about uh, shared value uh, platform. I think uh, in recent uh, years, uh, th this idea is very important, including the uh, impact investment and also the uh, ESGs, uh, uh, you know, uh, environment, social, and uh, governance. I think are very important. Uh, it's the right time to, to change our traditional uh, development aid policy and to a new generation of the investment and uh, more, more, more uh, social and environment and the governance impact. Uh, so, so now I would like to invite uh, our speaker here. And uh, Eliza, if you want. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, uh, we, we would like to open, before I open the uh, floor uh, qu question, uh, two of us is an uh, expert in China. If you have uh, any the question on China, I also you are, you are welcome uh, to, to raise. So now I uh, would like to open the floor to the audience. Oh, please. So, uh, maybe go, go first. Hello. Boa tarde. Meu nome é Alex Rodrigues Ross. Eu eu faço sexto período de administração e eu tenho uma pergunta para você para fazer vocês. Mas é, é relevante a declaração que eu vou fazer, porque eu, eu venho de uma família humilde, né, vim é, da favela, e meu pai morreu com, quando eu tinha dois anos de idade. É, é relevante o que eu estou falando, porque é, isso acarretou várias coisas na minha vida, é, e eu tive, por falta de planejamento familiar, fui pai cedo, é, e acabou que, é, durante... Mais de 10 anos eu fui afastado da escola, não pude é, é, fazer porque eu tinha que ter minhas obrigações. Durante esses dez, dez, mais de 10 anos eu fui camelô é, e, é, após os 30 anos, eu ingressei novamente na faculdade é, para poder, porque eu tinha, sempre tive esse sonho, mas eu fui afastado disso, é, de repente por causa de uma inversão de valores que tem sido criado na nossa sociedade, aonde é, parece que o, ser, o errado ele é certo. É, mas, na realidade, ele não é. E está muito difícil de converter isso. Porque eu digo, a minha esposa, hoje, após três anos, 13 anos, ela concluiu o ensino médio, né, devido eu também estar tá, é, incentivando ela, porque eu vi que era bom. E eu vejo, na minha família, não tem, não tem ninguém cursando faculdade. Né? Meus colegas, nenhum deles cursam faculdade. Mas eu tenho muitos colegas que eles estão agora no, no, no tráfico, né, estão sendo constantemente é, recrutados pelo tráfico, e eu fico extremamente triste, né, porque eu sei que agora, no momento que eu vivo, eu entendo que a, o conhecimento ele pode te libertar, de diversas formas, não somente financeiramente, mas também é, a, a mente, né, porque quanto mais você conhece, mais você quer conhecer. E isso tem, me, me traz muito benefício, e isso eu quero também é, é, é expandir para as pessoas que eu gosto, que eu amo, né, eu tive dois, dois familiares, dois primos que morreram devido à consequência do, do tráfico também. E é, a minha pergunta, no caso, é, ele, o, ele me falou de um projeto muito legal, muito bonito, bacana para caramba, que ele estava falando aqui. E eu entendo e eu queria saber de, qual a solução concreta né, que vocês que traria essa, essa conferência, né, com a solução concreta, para... Tirar aquelas pessoas que, 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 não, que não querem, né, que já se ingressaram no, 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 no valores errados. E qual seria a estratégia, né, já que tem diversos projetos? Mas a realidade é que nós, brasileiros, né, que é a maior parte que somos nós, né, que é a periferia, que é a maior, mais da metade da população, não temos acesso, é, agora bem mais por causa da internet, mas nós não tínhamos acesso aos programas, as, é, de, do governo, é, programas sociais, é, a não ser que nós procurássemos. No, no, no meu caso, foi assim, eu sempre fui muito curioso. E, devido a eu ter é, essa curiosidade, eu fui buscando conhecimento até o momento que eu consegui ingressar no FIES, fazer o Enem, e hoje em dia está fazendo isso. E a segunda pergunta 
é, o que poderia ser feito para pessoas como eu, que estamos assim na faculdade, mas temos nosso nosso emprego, eu tenho que criar meus filhos, né, no, no caso, e, e, e às vezes fica bem difícil. Se não fosse o FIES, eu agradeço muito, eu não poderia estar fazendo. Mas é, tem que fazer um inglês. tem é, Então, é, eu, eu, me, eu acredito que eu sou uma pessoa que eu sou predestinado porque eu quero, eu vou e eu faço. Mas eu fico preocupado com as pessoas que às vezes têm e acho que não podem fazer e que não, não e que a um, um certo momento da vida se acham até mesmo velhos e não tem mais e, e não se consideram mais capazes. Eu vi esse caso com a minha própria esposa porque eu falava para ela fazer, 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 fazer e ela falava que não era capaz. Ela fez e passou no seja é, direto a redação tirou uma nota máxima e tudo, e estudando apenas é, cinco dias, como a tecnologia ajudou muito ela, porque foi pelo YouTube, a gente, é, eu ajudava, eu fazia as coisas, é, tentava explicar o que yeah. eu sabia. Desculpe, pode você cortar a sua pergunta? Sim, porque o tempo é muito limitado. Obrigado. Okay, muito obrigado. Okay, okay, desculpa. É, a oportunidade, eu estou tentando expressar a, a, a parte da, da onde eu venho. entendeu? Muitos aqui não, não podem não conhecer. E essa é minha, minha, qual seria a solução concreta? Estaria sendo é, tra, trazendo, sendo traga pela, pela conferência para ajudar é, as pessoas que não que não não que não queiram, mas que não sabe, né, não, não, não tem essa força de vontade toda e para aqueles também que já conseguiram sair, mas que ainda tem diversos problemas porque nesse meio tempo pode muitos podem sair da faculdade. Qual seria essa? A solução concreta que a conferência está trazendo para a gente hoje. Thank you, thank you. We would like to collect more questions and response. Thank you very much. Uh, the question to Dr. Marcelo. Uh, you talked about this holding company structure, uh, and then all the beneficiaries are part of the holding company structure. So, so do the beneficiaries get a share in the profit of this holding company, and how does it work? And if at all, then uh, then it becomes more of a cooperative rather than uh, a kind of a private sector company. And the second question is that, uh, so when the big bad, guy, bad guys come and you also go there, so what is the link between those big guys and this uh, enterprise? Because you're talking about a value chain and they are talking, they're looking at their commercial interest. So are they investing in you, or uh, are they giving you some uh, grants, or what? So what is the relationship? Thank you. No, I'm okay. Yes, thank you again for both very interesting presentations. But I'm really uh, interested in knowing from Pranatura if uh, um, you also work in urban settings, if you have this kind of experience. And in what kind of, how do you deal with with this situation in a much more complex environment than, a, let's say, somewhere very um, apart from from the area? More questions? A question for Sarah. So your thoughts on other types of social protection other than the cash grants that you described. And I have in mind here things such as school feeding, uh, as well as grants which target different groups. So for example, grants that target women while they are pregnant rather than once the child is born. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Marcelo, maybe you want to give a response? Hello. Well, uh, is it on? Well, first of all, uh, your question that will kind of address your question. To your, to your question, I mean, I'm going to actually answer your question with the two answers that I'm giving to them, okay? Uh, pragmatically, I'll give you one scenario, which is you, those big bad guys go into a region and they see they, they have to live within this community. And uh, which is usually it's a very large area, a very vast area of impact they have. And the, those guys don't have a job. They, they usually are subsistence um, agriculturists. And once you go through this cycle, 
there will be a series of uh, companies. They will own shares of the holding company, so they have dividends, right? They will have an asset as far as the value of their shares will grow as the companies, the holding company own, get better and bigger. And they have a job because the labor of each one of those companies they own through the holding, they have the jobs. So they have a salary, they have a dividend, eventually when the, when the investors are paid off, uh, and uh, they have a sh an asset that has its value. So you have three things instead of zero, normally. Now to your second question, what is in it for the big guys? You can look in, into it through different angles. From in my experience is the individuals that sit on the boards and the other CFOs and the CEOs of those big companies, they have a human side. Sometimes people don't believe that, but it, it, it actually happens. And they have this human element of doing good and bringing something good for those people. But from a corporate point of view, from a bylaw of a company, the thing that it really moves them is um, risk mitigation. Do you know how much it costs a medium to big, large size mine stopping for each day? Each day you stop a mine if you lay your, if you, you know, stop a road on a big mine. If you stop a mine in Peru, Antamina, for example, which is the biggest mine in Peru, it could cost you about $20 million a day in stoppage costs. That's risk. And that's only the financial costs. We're talking about the, co the, ri the risk of uh, your your um, customers, your clients, that you're gonna cut your supply to them, so you become an unreliable supplier. You have an image cost in a company with half a billion dollars of uh, market share. If you do something really bad, as we had happen in Brazil just recently, take a look at the impact you have on your, on your value share, your share value. And if it is a one digital, one digit impact, on your total market cap, that's billions of dollars. So risk mitigation, that's the short answer to why the big bad guys do that. Good neighborhoods. As per human, uh, as per uh, uh, an urban setting, uh, you're absolutely right. It's much more complex to do in urban. We had 30 years of experience in rural be before we decided to move into urban, and we did. At a time, Rio de Janeiro was a little more peaceful than it is today. So we started a pilot in the Salgueiro area, and um, we identified the three main problems, they identified the main, three main problems they had. Waste, water supply, and power. Waste, nobody collected it. Um, power, it was all stolen. And water, it was one, once a, a week they had, they had water because the pump has to so we designed a business strategy using those three liabilities to become the economic anchor. Producing energy, collecting water, green roofs, and there's, I won't get into details, but trust me, it made sense financially, it made sense operationally, technology was all there. And then the AK-47s came back, <laughs> so we had to stop. So we had to take the people out. So that's the thing. So to your, to your answer, this is, I mean, this is a very pragmatic way to do it. Um, in the city is a bit more difficult than it is for the very reasons you've, you've outlined. So we have to solve that too. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Um, yeah, is it on? Yeah, um, thanks. Other types of social protection. Let me, let me first just address a little bit this, this broader question of, um, you know, ideally, we would aim to expand social protection coverage across the life course, and this is the ILO social protection floor, etc. So that you know, people are covered in the event of contingencies from birth to <laughs> old age and death, um, and there are various kinds of programs to do that. The more that those are universal programs that are accessible to all and where people have entitlement to access them, the less you see the exclusions that you're talking about in, in your particular case. Um, 
the more they're universal as opposed to very narrowly targeted. Of course, they're targeted in the sense that they might be child grants or grants for old people, pensions. Um, but the more narrowly poverty targeted they are, the more likely you are to have very high administrative costs and very high exclusions of, of people. So trying to get that balance between affordability and inclusion is, is, is obviously critical. And I'm definitely not somebody who thinks that cash is the answer to everything. So in answer to your question, you know, there's a lot of different programs around the world. We have had a big shift, particularly sort of since the beginning of the conditional cash transfers in Latin America, to a real revolution in coverage of social protection, which is very positive, but also towards cash as the main instrument. But there are other instruments, and I think often they are accompanying. So in some of the programs here, along with those cash grants came issues, access to school feeding or um, school uniforms or support, you know, other forms of support. Um, school feeding programs are clearly a hugely important and sensible <laughs> thing in, in many contexts. Um, you know, as a way, and often in, an incentive for parents to send kids to school so that they actually get fed, um, and it may be the only real meal they're getting. So, so absolutely, there's, there's a lot of different mechanisms um, that can be used. I think the research we were doing here was really focused on these programs as a way to, to um, expand social protection coverage you know, it, it, through nationally scalable um, programs. I think the other side to that, of course, which I mentioned, is, is the access and the supply side. And ag again, we, we're moving, you know, the debate around social policy, the sort of language is shifting a bit to thinking about social investment. And um, on the whole, we think of these as expenditures and on the sort of consumption side. But really, you know, whether it's school feeding, whether it's other social protection programs for um, often they're targeted, some of these Africa ones also are targeted to pregnant women and, and women with children under five or, you know, different age groups. These are absolutely investments in the future and, and in human capital, if you want to use that term, or you know, future productivity. So I think we, we also have to really think about how do we look within budgets at these expenditures and, and to try and think about them as an investment and, and um, you know, yeah, put more emphasis on, them, on the investment side, the social investment side um, of these social policies. Thank you, thank you, the response. Uh, okay. I missed one little part of the question of the gentleman. It was uh, how, why do they pay it, and, and, and how do they pay it? It's an investment, back to your point, absolutely agree completely with you. You can measure today the impact of these investments that are usually non-financial returns, but you can even translate into financial terms that. Uh, in, our, in my mercenary hat, I have, uh, we have a tool that does that. It's called uh, the Earth Dividend. Anyway, but the first movement, financial movement, is on the is a small two to four million dollar investment the company makes because it's de-risking their portfolio. It's de-risking their investment, their operation. That money cycles back and continues to go. The investment on the next bit tranche, which is the larger one, they have obviously the option to do so, but usually they don't. It's not their business. It's, and usually it's a little more, bit more money than, than social or, or, or corporate uh, um, investments, whatever, it's three digits, so they just don't touch it. So it doesn't, they don't need to. You have appetite for other investors, so that's it. Their investments is to create the tools to attract that capital, and that capital moves on. And in the urban area, we did find actually one community that don't have AK-47s, about 30,000 people, and uh, we are restarting there. It's out of the Boa Vista, it's in the area of Rio de Janeiro. Sorry, I just wanted to compliment the two. Yeah, I think uh, because uh, uh, limited expertise, I think uh, three of us cannot cover all the thing, all, all, all of the of the social, political, and economic strategy. Uh, but uh, yeah, based on uh, the Chinese experience for the poverty uh, elevation, 
you know, in the, in the last uh, four decades, I think we have a different stage as a different uh, solutions. In the very beginning, the later 1970s, that at that time, you know, poverty reduction is a uh, economic issues. We should uh, increase the GDP or income. And then in enter the 1990s, that become uh, social economic issues. The social factors involved in uh, poverty reductions. And then uh, in, uh, after the 20, uh, I think the poverty reduction become a political issues. The government must uh, do the make a decision because China now is, a, is enough p capacity to do the impact investment or, or whatever, ESG or, or shared value uh, platform. I think a different stage we should uh, prioritize our task and for the, for the, uh, the, the poverty reduction. And the science and, and technology also has a different roles in a different stage, I think we should. Uh, so up now, we should uh, go to uh, integrated, integrated solutions approach. Maybe it's a, a best way for the, for the So anyway, thank you. Thank you for, for the, our three the speakers, uh, the insights, and also for the interaction uh, between uh, the, uh, and, uh, the expert and the audience. And also, thank you, <laughs> Alisa, for, for, your, for, for your writings for the Professor Redas uh, PowerPoint. Thank you. Thank you very much.